Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to today's event, um, Integrity Over Politics, with uh, Knesset member Amichai Shikli. Um, so today's event, um, the title for today's <coughs> event is uh, very appropriate. Um, I will have uh, our president, Moral Klein, introduce um, uh, MK Amichai Shikli. But before that, I would just say, um, that uh, it's a rare occurrence where you see uh, politicians who put Israel and put their own country before, before themselves. Um, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Amichai. Um, I've seen him uh, uh, being asked to join a, a government that he doesn't believe uh, will serve Israel in the best way. He was offered um, many uh, positions, lucrative positions and titles. He was pressured by the media and Israeli media know how to pressure. And he said, no, this is not good for Israel. I'm staying out of it. So thank you, Michai, for that. Um, thank you for, to uh, Shel Farlich, our local uh, Michigan president, ZOA president, for making this happen. Um, I will, before the introductions, I will just say that um, Michai will speak, uh, after the introductions, Michai will speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll open the mic for questions. Um, so now it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce our uh, ZOA national president, Mor Klein. Now, in order to introduce Mor Klein, uh, one must have to talk about uh, ZOA and what it stands for, since uh, Mort has shaped ZOA, the Zionist Organization of America, to what it is today. What's unique about ZOA and why I'm uh, uh, very proud to be part of this organization is that we stand up for truth and we stand up for Israel, even when it's not always the most popular, popular thing to do. During the um, Oslo Accords, most of the Jewish establishment was for the Oslo Accords. ZOA uh, was the only major Jewish American organization who opposed the Oslo Accords, who talked about the dangers that would um, occur because of that. <clears throat> and um, unfortunately, after the Oslo Accords, 2,000 uh, Israelis were, uh, were murdered by a Palestinian terrorist. ZOA was the only American Jewish organization under the leadership of Moore Klein that opposed the disengagement from Gaza. Um, in 2005, uh, ZOA warned about the dangers and unfortunately, um, um, ap soon after thousands of rockets and um, terror tunnels were created by Hamas. Um, I'm proud to say that uh, ZOA has played a major role in um, moving the uh, American embassy to Jerusalem, in having the previous administration recognize the Golan Heights as being part of Israel. ZOA continuously warns about the two-state solution and the dangers that will happen after. ZOA is the only organization that stands up and says Judea and Samaria belongs to the Jewish state. We, Judea and Samaria, is uh, part of, uh, of our history, our ancestors. King David has been there. Many of the heroes have been there. We are um, lobbying and promoting Jewish presence in the entire uh, Judea land. ZOA is the, really the only organization in the US that fights all forms of anti-Semitism, both from the right and the left, including the BDS movement, which boycotts only Jews. And finally, we are very proud of our campus department that um, is standing up for Israel on campus and educating the, the next generation to stand up for Israel. Now it is my pleasure to um, pass the mic to our president, uh, Mr. Mork Klein. Well, thank you so much, Kobe. Uh, it's an honor for me to be with the distinguished uh, MK. Uh, I wanna thank Sheldon Freilich also for helping to arrange this. Thank you so much, Sheldon. Uh, uh, member Knesset Amichai Chikli is a member of the Yamina party. This is a party uh, headed by the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, Naftali Bennett, and Ayala Chaked, who's the Minister of the Interior. <laughs> he comes from a traditional Jewish family. His father was a Masorti rabbi. Uh, uh, he's spent a number of years in the IDF, and he was a member of the Golani Brigade, which is a very selective and prestigious group uh, of uh, IDF soldiers. He uh, has his bachelor's degree in security and Middle Eastern studies. He went to graduate school at Tel Aviv University studying diplomacy and security. <laughs> and most, 
this, uh, what's most distinguished about uh, Amichai Chikli is in May 2021, he announced that he will not vote for a government, even against his own party, if it includes either the extremist left-wing, almost communist party merits, who's willing to do, uh, to give, make unilateral withdrawals without any uh, uh, basis that this is good for Israel, uh, or he said he will not vote for a party for a government that includes Ra'am, which is the radical anti-Israel Muslim Brotherhood party in, this, in Israel. <laughs> Ra'am doesn't support Israel's existence as a Jewish state, has warned Prime Minister Bennett if he responds too strongly to Hamas and Hezbollah rockets, they will leave the government and bring it down. This may be a reason why uh, Prime Minister Bennett didn't even mention the Palestinian Authority in his speech to the UN when he, I believe he should have. Uh, although Prime Minister Bennett has made it clear publicly he opposes the Palestinian state. And by the way, most people don't know that two thirds of the Palestinian Authority in, in the most recent poll, only a few weeks ago, oppose a, two, a so-called two state solution. They oppose establishing a Palestinian state if it means accepting Israel. Uh, their goal is Israel's destruction. We have to make that crystal clear as, uh, as uh, uh, M.K. Amichai Chikli has done. <laughs> so when the government was formed with Meretz and Ra'am, Amichai Chikli was the only member of the Yamina party who voted against it. This showed not only courage, but enormous principle and a deep understanding of the true uh, uh, problems of the Arab Islamic war against the Jewish state of Israel. <laughs> so it's my really honor and delight to welcome MK Amichai Chikli and introduce uh, Amichai Chikli to the ZOA uh, audience. MK Chikli, thank you so much for being with us. It's truly an honor for us. Thank you for being one of the strong Jews who does what's right, no matter what others are trying to pressure you to do. I present to you MK Amichai Chikli. Thanks so much, uh, Morton. To hear these, uh, these words from you with such a unique and inspiring history, you and your family, that's very um, exciting. So thanks so much. Um, thank you, Kobe, for inviting me. Thank you, ZOA, for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, just to understand, you've sent some questions. Would you like these questions to be asked later on, or you, you want it now in these 20 minutes? Like what's the... So I think, um, I think if you um, give us a little talk about uh, wh um, what brought you to Yamina, what, um, what is the reason you didn't join the government? What do you mm -hmm. see the dangers of the government um, is, are right now? And then after for tw about 20 minutes uh, after you're done, we can, uh, we can present you with the questions. Okay. So um, I grew up in Israel, first generation. Both my parents, they made Aliyah. Uh, my father was born in Tunisia. My mother was born in French. And so I always remind the action of my father. We're going to read Parashat Lech Lecha on Shabbat. For me, my father who left all his family to make Aliyah, to come to Eretz Israel. That's my own private Abraham. That's my own private Lech Lecha. This is where I'm coming from. First of all, it's my parents. And I think all of us as Jews, when you go uh, to shul on Shabbat and you are asked to uh, stand and read in the Torah, they would say, um, we welcome uh, Amich Yale, Amichai, the son of Eitan and Kamil. You will never, they will never say just your private name. And I think we do not stand alone. We have responsi responsibility for our fathers. And when I read in the Ten Commandments, the words, it is not just our private father and mother. It is the father of mothers of all of us throughout history, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and all the rest of the Jewish history throughout the year. And this is my perspective. I call it the perspective of, it's not my term, it is a common term of Netzach Israel. And always what stand in front of my eyes is, I would say in a paraphrase, Shiviti, Netzach Israel, Lenegdi Tamid. Always to see what can I do 
with my small impact, it's not a dramatic impact, what can I do for Netzach Israel? And I think that this period of time uh, for all of us, for Jews, especially Zionist Jews in America and in Israel, this period is very um, decisive. Everything looks normal. Everything looks okay. But I think that first of all, um, we live in an unnormal era and in a very, with great challenges for Judaism and for Zionism in America and in Israel. And uh, to be very honest, I think that we are in one of uh, the, uh, the most dangerous period for the continuity of Judaism and Zionism. And I think that the greatest challenge that we are facing is not Hamas, it's not Iran, it is the progressive ideology uh, that, uh, that, that is going uh, against the very basic idea of nationalism, or against the very basic idea of family, and above all, against the very basic idea of freedom and the, the, the freedom of speech and the freedom of even thinking what you, you want to think as, as a free man. And I think this is a great threat for America. And this is also a great threat for Israel. And we need, first of all, to look um, to the challenge um, directly in the eyes, this, uh, let's, let's say, spiritual and ideological challenge is, I think, the greatest challenge that we are facing today. And we see it very uh, um, strongly in the campuses of America. We'll see the, all the PC, the way you should talk, the way you should think uh, to be a Zionist today in the University of Columbia or the University of Harvard. That's a very dangerous thing to do if you want to be to have friends and you want to maybe to move forward and to be professor and doctor, et cetera. And the, the, the idea of the progressive movements, we, we face it also in Israel uh, as well. So that's on a very like the broader, the, the broad picture. And in America, you see assimilation. And in Israel, people think, okay, in Israel, we don't have the problem of assimilation, but that's not very accurate. Because the moment Zionism and Judaism are not important for you, the fact that you speak Hebrew doesn't matter. And all of you who visited Israel, I'm, I'm sure, were surprised to hear many Israelis that not necessarily care about their Jewish identity, not necessarily care about their Zionist identity. And I think that the greatest challenge we are facing today is spiritual, it is ideological, and we need to go back to basic. Nothing needs to be invented. We just need to go back to basic. You know what? We need to go back to the... This organization was established in 1897. That's the, the Jewish Congress of Herzl, who said Zionism first and foremost. That's his first speech on the Congress. He said, Zionism is the return to Judaism. And today, some people think that these are two separate things. No, but Zionism and Judaism, they are both combined. And he was not the first Zionist thinker who said it. Before Herzl, there was a great, great philosopher, Moshe Hess, who wrote the fascinating book, Rome and Jerusalem, 1862. And in 1862, um, uh, this, this uh, leader, Moshe Hess, said the idea of separating Jewish nationalism, uh, nationalism from Judaism is insane. This it means to destroy, to destroy Judaism. Because when you open Tfilat Shmonaisre, you're saying We want people of Israel. We have the idea of Aliyah. Okay, not everyone can do Aliyah, but that's obviously a Zionist goal. And we're saying we want to build our nation. Once again, we want to have a solid, strong state, a Jewish state. And he was the first uh, um, philosopher to say it loud. And that's what I mean when I'm saying to go back uh, 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 to the mamash, to the basic. And one last comment about history. The last speech of Herzl 
was in 1903 with the dramatic Congress that dealt with the a, a question whether we should send a delegation to Uganda, yes or no. Uh, the Congress decided to send a delegation and then there was an entire mess and one third of the Congress just left. The, the guy from uh, the people from uh, Russia, from the Chibat Zion movement, and they sat on the floor in some room and they tear up their clothes like Tisha Be'av. And they uh, basically, the Congress was uh, ended. And then uh, at, the at night, uh, the um, uh, Wolfson, the uh, deputy of uh, Herzl, he told him, look, there is no Congress. We can go back to the discussion tomorrow. They are still locked down in the, uh, locked in the room. So Herzl went to speak with them. He knocked on the door. They made a vote whether to let Herzl uh, come in, yes or no, decided to let him in. Herzl came in and then they made like a surcha, they, they, they agreed to, to, to come back. And the last words of Herzl in a Zionist Congress was, were, And that's what I'm saying when I'm saying to go back to basic. Now, when I needed to vote um, in the parliament, uh, against or for this uh, um, specific uh, um, government led by Naftali Bennett, uh, that's what I had in mind. Does this government going to take us forward? Is it going to strengthen the Zionist idea? It, it is, is it going to strengthen the power of Israel um, first inside towards the Arab minority that is challenging Israel's security from within, and the idea of Israel as a Jewish state from within, first with a very uh, anti-Israel MK members from the joint list and also from Ram list, that's one. And second, uh, when it comes against Iran, against Hamas, and so on and so on. And I said, look, we have several major problems with this government. First, in terms of democracy, the idea of prime minister with six mandates only, I found it unacceptable. That's not a functioning democracy. I'm saying, okay, if you wanna make a, a government with Yair Lapid, okay, go and be the minister of security and let Yair Lapid who have far more mandates, he will be the prime minister. So before we speak right and left, Zionism, yes or no, democratically, I think it's just, it, it, it just we, I never saw such a thing, not, not in Israel and not in, in, the, in any Western country. That's first. Second, we've, we've, we said to our voters, Yamina voters, that we are going to um, build a right-wing uh, oriented government. We said that we will not let Yair Lapid, who we just look at the speech he made about anti-Semitism, the greatest uh, uh, um, uh, research, researcher, uh, uh, professor of the Holocaust, uh, Yuda Bauer, said that basically Yair Lapid took from, he just it took out of the term anti-Semitism anti -Semitism, all its content because it said anti-Semitism is to go against the black, it's to go against LGBT. So it's basically everything. That's exactly the progressive idea. It's just, everything is the, is the same. So we mentioned, we're not going to uh, uh, establish a government with Meretz party that says that it is okay to have IDF officers being judged in Hague, we said that we are not going to uh, establish a government with the Ram um, um, Islamic um, party, et cetera, et cetera. We said that in the first day of the government, we are going to approve uh, the young settlements in uh, uh, Judea and Samaria. And we see that all these promises that we made to the voters, we need to uh, basically uh, give up on all these uh, um, promises. And in one of his uh, uh, first 
interviews as prime minister, Naftali Bennett says, look, when you are entering the room of the prime minister, you need to put aside politics. You need to put aside everything that goes with it. And I'm saying, what? What do you mean? We didn't came here to have the role of this kind of minister or prime minister. We came because we believe that we can push forward our values, which is politics. That's exactly politics. What do you mean we put politics aside? And that's why I decided that I'm uh, gonna vote against uh, this government. Even if it would say that I won't be part of the next Knesset, even if it says that I won't have any uh, significant role in the government, uh, I'm not at all. And uh, basically that's, uh, that's the story shortly. Uh, thank you, Amichai. Um, so the first question, uh, we'll, uh, we'll let um, um, our president, Mor Klein, if you have a question for uh, uh, MK Amichai, please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Amichai. That was a powerful, inspiring speech. Thanks so much. You clearly have incredibly heartfelt love of uh, Eretz Yisrael and Yiddishkeit. <laughs> First of all, I would like to ask you, for the few ZOA people who don't speak Hebrew, could you translate the final speech of Herzl that you mentioned? You said it in Hebrew, so some ah, of us didn't understand. If I will forget Jerusalem, I will forget my right hand. We say it on the <laughs> wedding, so I thought everyone knows it. Yeah? Uh, my question, could you give us your insights into whether uh, Naftali Bennett, who promised to build in Yehuda and Shamron, who promised to not allow a consulate to be open in Jerusalem, could you tell us what the status is of those two issues? And could you also tell us, is Ra'am having a real impact? Is Naftali Bennett changing his policies because the Muslim Brotherhood, the anti-Israel party is in the government. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on those issues. Thank you. Sure. So um, the American, uh, the current uh, American um, government, it is, it, it's, it's a huge, huge change from uh, the Trump administration. Uh, we know the opinion uh, of Anthony Blinken and we are far, um, we know about the progressive um, group in the Democratic Party, and we saw the impact when there was the vote in the Congress uh, regarding the uh, Iron Dome, and we know all about the squad, and we are following closely what's going on in the American Congress, and I myself, I'm very um, worried about the future of the Democratic Party uh, because of this group that has, I think, significant power, and this group is actually anti-Semite, and I mean Rashida Talib, Ailan El Omar, and um, the rest of this uh, group, and also others not in the Congress like uh, Linda Salsur, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And now, about the, uh, the consulate uh, of the Palestinian in Jerusalem. Um, the tactic of the uh, American administration and Bennett Lapid administration is to say, okay, now we want to have some quiet period so that we can pass the budget. But the moment we're gonna pass the budget and we're gonna have a far more solid government and, and far more solid administration, we will open uh, the Palestinian consulate in Agron Street at the heart of Jerusalem. That's gonna happen 100%, um, unfortunately. And um, Lapid won't stop it. Bennett doesn't have the power to stop it. And the um, American administration, Blinken, um, and, and the entire administration is very, very determined to do it and that's, uh, very uh, significant part of his policy. On the symbolic um, dimension, 
that is a huge blow to the efforts of Trump administration um, to, to explain to the world and for, to the American peoples that Jerusalem is the eternal united capital of the Jewish people. So it is, it's not just a consulate, a Palestinian consulate in uh, uh, the heart of Jerusalem. It is far more worse in, in terms of the symbolic act. It is basically a Palestinian embassy in the heart of Jerusalem. And I think that these are very bad news for every Zionist. So that's, that's one. Second, in terms of Judea and Samaria, the policy of the current administration is similar to the policy of the Obama administration. We are hearing again the same slogans about natural growth of uh, the settlements in Judea and Samaria. Natural growth means no growth. That's bad news. That's also, I think we are heading towards um, natural growth. So it is nice to say natural growth, but actually it means that no major projects will be built in Judea and Samaria, uh, uh, most likely. Um, about Ram, uh, at the election period and a little bit after the election, the head of the Ram party, Mansour Abbas, and made some very, uh, I would say, moderate speech. Um, he talked to the, uh, to the, to the Israeli uh, public, says we want to be part of Israeli society, and um, we're going to put aside national issues, and we're going to work together with the government. At first, he wanted to work with Netanyahu and with the right wing, but then when Bennett uh, took the shift into the left, he decided to go with Bennett and Yair Lapid. Me, myself, I was not an expert. Uh, and I, uh, when, I've listened, when I listened to Mansour Abbas, I did not have a very solid opinion if it is a bad idea or a good idea. I said, look, the joint list is ultra anti-Zionist uh, and they are always empowering terrorists and they're not supposed to be in the Knesset in terms of uh, Israeli law. But Mansour Abbas, it was a different, it, it, a different messages. But as time goes by and we had the chance to learn who are the members of Ra'am list, Iman Khatib, Walid Ta, uh, Saad al Harumi, who passed away. These people, all of them, al Harumi who passed away, went to Akko uh, to strengthen uh, um, people who uh, were arrested because they committed lynch in Jews uh, in Akko and also murdered uh, a Professor Areven, who was uh, awarded in uh, Israel uh, Security Award. And Walid Ta said that the prisoners of Hamas and the all other terror organizations are freedom prisoners. And the real terrorists are those who arrested them, meaning the IDF. Iman Khatib from Ram said that um, Israeli police is barbarian and Jews are not allowed to step in Al Aqsa, etc., etc. So basically, you have what Mansour Abbas is saying, and then you have the entire list. So generally, Ram list is uh, unfortunately a very problematic list that is promoting Islamist ideas and some uh, uh, pro-terrorist ideas. And it's true that Mansour Abbas himself is very, very selective with his words, but his ideas and his words are not dominating really the party. And the greatest concern is the budget that's supposed to go to the Arab minority in Israel. Now, we are liberals and we want the Arab uh, minority to have um, equal rights and we want the Arab minority uh, to have uh, investment of the government. But we need to make sure that the money goes 
to the right places uh, and to the right ideas. We want them to uh, be part of Israeli society. We want them to con contribute to Israeli society. But if the money gonna go to Ra'am, people on the ground, meaning the Islamic uh, movement, uh, unfortunately, we're not gonna see anything positive that is coming out of these uh, investments. And that's uh, my greatest concern. And I'm speaking now about money that's supposed to go to welfare, education, et cetera. And I'm not speaking about roads or uh, uh, construction, et cetera, et cetera. So that's about uh, Ra'am. Um, next question. Okay, <clears throat> next question is from uh, Kevin Ross, uh, Philadelphia ZOA's uh, president. Um, why does the Israeli government allow the Palestinians to, um, to build illegally in Judea and Samaria? Uh, there are now over 60,000 illegal Arab uh, structures in Area C. Uh, it seems that Israel, this administration and the previous governments um, are giving up on Judea and Samaria. W what do you say about that? Okay. The very basic thing that we need to understand is that actually the conflict with the Palestinians is not just with the Palestinians, but also it is in um, some aspects, uh, Palestinian and the EU together. Uh, the EU is investing millions in uh, construction programs in area C and uh, Germany, France, Sweden and other European countries are funding uh, this constructive uh, construction project all over Area C. Um, you can see their signs on schools. You can see their signs on um, solar panels for Bedouin tents, uh, on uh, water cans, uh, etc. So this is far, far more than just uh, illegal. Palestinian construction. This is a part of a strategic plan of the EU and the Palestinian government. It was. It started with uh, the former uh, prime minister um, of the Palestinian Authority, and um, I just uh, forgot his name. Um, I will. I will get to it uh, in a moment. But it's a combined project of the EU and the Palestinian Authority. Fayad, Salam Fayad. Sorry. So, um, and the construction uh, in C area is very, very accurate. Uh, every, every construction project is aimed to block a Jewish village, a Jewish chain of, of villages. Um, so it is something very, very dramatic. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the former government was not a right wing um, full power government. You had uh, the Minister of Security, Benny Gantz, and people like Nissan Koren, and they are backing up uh, EU actions on uh, Area C, and they are backing up the policy within uh, some part of the army, what we call uh, the uh, civilian, um, civilian, uh, uh, civilian management of uh, this region. And unfortunately, the civilian management uh, is not very decisive when it comes to uh, uh, force the law and to destroy the illegal construction uh, uh, projects of the Palestinians. We have a lot of work to do uh, when we will get to power. This government will do nothing against the EU, that's for sure. Okay, so uh, the next question is from uh, Barbara Levin. Um, we saw during the, uh, the Guardian of the Walls operation against Hamas, uh, the recent operation against Hamas, the Israeli Arabs uh, rioted and, uh, and um, created pogroms. Um, Jews were afraid of leaving their homes. Actually, um, uh, there were major highways in Israel that were blocked in the north in the south, in some of the center. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like a strategic threat to Israel if there's gonna be a war against Hezbollah or Iran, or even against Hamas. Um, does Israel recognize that there's a real problem 
and uh, what do you think can be done to uh, um, uh, against this challenge? Okay, so I think that right after the spiritual and ideological challenge from within, with us, Jews in America, Zionist Jews in America and in Israel, the next great challenge, if we take a SWAT, is the Arab minority in Israel. Um, there is a uh, rigid Gabriel. She have a very uh, useful term, the irrelevant majority. So when you speak about the Arab minority, there is a significant group. I don't think it's the majority, but it is a significant group that want to be part of Israel society. But this group is very quiet and they are very afraid to speak in favor of Israel. And unfortunately, until now, we haven't seen this group um, fulfilling its potential on the political sphere in Israel. They have almost no representative in the Knesset. The most moderate Arab uh, MK in the Knesset is Isawi Fridge, who uh, said, said many times said that he is against violence, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but he's 100% a pro-Palestinian. So that's to begin with. And then you have the group, which is very strong politically, the joint list, Ram list, and is very strong in the academia and in the culture, the Palestinian group. Uh, they've placed their vision in a series of documents, vision documents, in 2006. And their philosophy is as such. First, they are saying, Israel was established as a result of the Holocaust. That's the only reason why there is a, a, a Jewish state. And the victims of the victims of the Holocaust are the innocent Palestinians. Israel, they're saying, is a colonialist state that tried to commit an ethnic cleansing in 1948. Israel is an immoral state who have no right to exist as a Jewish state. And our vision is to see Israel becoming a non-Jewish state, meaning uh, a, a, a neutral state with no nationality in what we are calling now Israel and in Judea and Samaria to have a Palestinian Judenrein state with no Jews. That's their vision. Very clear. There is no way uh, to, it, it, not complicated. That's the vision. And about narrative, the Palestinian narrative is extremely problematic because the very basic, the heart of the narrative, like the, the beginning, the genesis of the Palestinian identity is the Nakba 1948 and the 1967 and then other events, all of them are around Israel. If you take the struggle against Israel and the struggle against Zionism from the Palestinian identity, there is no Palestinian identity. Palestinian identity, identity cannot stand alone. It can, it, can, it can stand only in the context of fighting Israel. And as we know, people are not very fast are going to give up their identity. So this is the ideological uh, atmosphere that created the events that we've seen in May. Now, the other question is, what happened to the police? What happened to the police? Where is the police? So we had uh, another uh, uh, events pretty similar in 2000. The Palestinian led by Arafat um, went to the Second Intifada, the very bloody Second Intifada, 
Uh, we are now uh, mentioning uh, uh, it was today uh, in, two, in 2000 when there was the lynch in Ramallah. I'm, I'm sure you remember that that was uh, one of the most horrific events uh, in the history of Israel and, and the Palestinians. And then the Arab minority said, okay, we want to join our brothers in the West Bank and we are also, uh, we will start an intifada. And there were clashes between the police and the Arab minority. And 13 uh, Arabs uh, were killed uh, in those events. And then there was uh, Aaron Barak a deputy, Theodore Orr. They made an invest investigation, uh, state investigations to examine what happened in these events. And they are based, and basically they kicked out of the police every single commander, senior or not senior, who uh, ordered to use force against the Arabs. And so uh, two decades afterwards, you can see that the police, they just, they decided not to interfere. And when the head of the police spoke on TV, they said, okay, we just wanna create silence and to separate between both sides. And people said to the head of the police, what are you talking about both sides? Jews were sitting alone in their homes, doing nothing. And so I think we have a huge <laughs> challenge with the police. And, um, and we have a huge challenge with the Arab minority. And I think that um, the main mission is to explain to the Arabs that the majority of uh, the Jews in Israel, um, their uh, tolerance is not endless and um, enough is enough. And to, we said to the police here in the Knesset, enough is enough. You must check yourself. It cannot happen again. That's about me. Okay, thank you. So um, the next question, we actually have, uh, we had similar questions, so I'm going to combine it into one, uh, but the main question is from uh, Cheryl Silver, our ZOA National Board Member and Secretary. Um, given the, the, um, the exit from Afghanistan and given the fact that, and putting into it the fact that Yair Lapid is very close to the Biden administration, uh, it seems like also Bennett is now be becoming close to the Biden administration. Do you think that Bennett's government has what it takes uh, to deal with Iran and to and to act um, if uh, action is needed, given the uh, the threat that Iran uh, poses to Israel? Um, first of all, I think that what we've seen in Afghanistan is um, an ex extremely uh, significant event with uh, the meaning of this event. We cannot even start to think first, just morally, think about it. Every terrorist organization, Islamic terrorist organization on the face of earth looked at this event and said, look what a great victory. We just need to be patient. The West is weak. America is weak. America lost the war. She opened the war because of 9-11. And look what happened at the end. America invested billions in Afghanistan. And they, I think it's what, $86 billion equipment that was left behind. Helicopters, tanks. It, it, I think it's, it is so bad. And it is also very bad for Israel. Hamas leaders uh, wrote uh, that what a significant victory and we should go on the same path as the Taliban and uh, Muslim leaders here in Israel uh, uh, from Ram list said the same things and Hezbollah is watching and Iran is watching. And I think that this is a, a great, great blow for America, for Israel and for, for the West. Uh, in generally, I think that the West is, is in a very fragile moment uh, in history. 
and um, we must wake up. And unfortunately, and I hate to say it, I don't believe that Lapid and Bennett can face Iran. They don't have the guts. They don't have the guts to stand against uh, uh, Biden and against um, uh, uh, Anthony Blinken. They, they're, they're not made of the um, ideological materials that can stand against this power. Um, and unfortunately, when it comes to Iran, uh, I'm not optimistic. And I think uh, that we will need to make every effort we can um, to create some changes in the government that we have today in Israel. Okay, so um, and before I let uh, Mort ask the, the final question, or if you have any sure. thoughts, Mort, um, I just want to mention, um, th first of all, thank you everybody for coming. We're not done yet. We're, we have a few more minutes left. Um, we're, um, I'm happy to announce that ZUA is going to have its uh, superstar um, national uh, gala December 19. We have very special guests. I can't tell you who it is. Uh, very high profile, uh, but please join us. Please support us. Um, every your your donations count. Uh, we stand for Israel. We stand for what for the truth, um, and um, every dollar counts. Um, so uh, now I I'm going to pass the mic to Mort. Um, if you have a uh, closing thoughts for uh, Michai, uh, Michai for me again, uh, personal fan. I I've been following you since uh, you came to politics. I see a, a bright future for you and. Uh, Maybe one day we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll host you as a uh, prime minister of Israel. Thank you. Wow. Thanks so much, Kobe. Thanks so much. Well, MK uh, Chickley, uh, I thought I knew most uh, everything about the, the Israeli situation. And yet I learned so much from you today. You were Thanks extraordinary, so really Thanks extraordinary, so powerful, straightforward, candid. <laughs> we need more MKs like you. Uh, Thank you so much, Martin. We, and we need more Jewish leaders in America like you, which we don't have, I'm afraid no. to say. Um, <laughs> first of all, I'd like you, uh, I didn't quite get the response. Do, do you think that Ra'am is clearly having an impact on what Naftali Bend is doing? Is he re restrained from doing what Israel needs to do because of Ra'am? And... Uh, I also wanted to let everyone know, I will reveal that uh, at our gala, December 19th, our virtual gala, we're having former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, that's confirmed. Wow. And we're having Congressman Alan West, who's one of the greatest friends of Israel, one of the most intelligent and knowledgeable friends of Israel we've ever had in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and I also wanted to mention to M.K. Chickley, you should understand, and you, you probably do, that the poll numbers show that Biden's support is collapsing. His approval ratings have dropped into the 30s, his disapproval into the 50s. So Americans are extremely upset with this government. He does not have the support of the American people. So he's gonna have a hard, harder and harder time doing what he wants to do. So the Israelis should understand that this government in America is very weak, does not have the support uh, of, uh, of the American people. The polls show that clearly, and other uh, aspects of what's going on in America also show that clearly. <laughs> so uh, thank you again. I look forward to meeting you in person. If you come to wow. you America. Thank you, Moulton. So I, I'm just interested, do you perceive that Ra'am is having sure, an impact sure. on the government. And secondly, do you think this government is going to remain in power for a long time? So look, um, I think just like what we're seeing in America, you're mentioning that Biden is going uh, down in the polls. I think that we can see the same, um, the same trend uh, also <laughs> in Israel. This is a very weak, uh, very weak government. And uh, I don't think it's gonna stay for a long period, um, but to say what exactly gonna happen in the future, that's difficult, as we know. About Ram, they have a huge power in this government. Wow. First, first, 
they have the interior committee in the Knesset, a very significant committee. And second, they have the Arab special committee led by Mansour Abbas. Third, they have a budget of uh, estimated of 53 billion uh, shekels um, that's supposed to um, um, go to the Arab minority in the next years. It's not the, the coming year, it's several years. And the um, office that is deciding where will the money goes to and how exactly is, is uh, um, very impacted by Ra'am. There is a, uh, an office that the name of it is Pituach um, HaChevra Aravid, the development of the uh, Arab society and Ram appointed the CEO and Ram appointed senior leaders and they can uh, have a very dramatic uh, impact. Where will the money go to? And if, we'll, the, and if this money will go to the Islamic movement and uh, most likely it will go to the Islamic movement, in the next election, uh, Ram will be uh, twice stronger. Mansour Abbas will be twice stronger. And I, unfortunately, I think that these are uh, not these are not good news uh, for Israel. And to be optimistic at the end, I really think that the world need a strong America, proud America. I think that the very basic idea of freedom, the very basic idea of America is challenged today by the progressive uh, philosophy and also by uh, non-democratic uh, superpowers uh, on earth. And uh, we have a lot of work to do in America and in Israel. Thank you, Amir. Well, thank you. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, Mark, go ahead. That's right, I just wanted to thank Amir and I also wanted to, urge everyone to please, those of you who are not members, join the ZOA, go to our website, zoa.org, become a member, make a contribution, make us stronger. So this voice of ZOA and MK Chickley is stronger and has more influence. That can happen if more people join ZOA and more people support ZOA financially. Uh, so again, go to zoa.org, join us, support us, uh, give us more resources so we can fight uh, this increasingly difficult fight for Eretz Israel and for sincere, stronger, beneficial U.S.-Israel relations. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. And I'll let uh, uh, Kobe Erez uh, finish. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just want to say thank you, Molton and Kobe. Thanks so much for having me. This is such a great honor to speak it for uh, the ZOA, really. It is uh, an amazing experience. So thanks so much. Thank you, Amicha. We hope to we hope to see you in uh, person. Uh, we we actually have trips to Israel where we bring um, um, Americans to Israel. And maybe we can meet you there. Um, again, thank you, um, and thank you everybody for joining. Hashem Thank you. God is with you. Thank you. Thanks so much.